to do tonight. We're going to talk about how to change and adapt to these markets that are out there. And so we're going to cover this in several steps. We're going to talk about right now, like why we're here. We're going to talk about one of the biggest challenges, the mental obstacle. We're going to cover the seven steps to profits. We're going to talk about changing markets and changing market character. We're also going to talk about tools for today, strategies, and then summary next steps, some cool announcements and everything for you guys, uh, along with the Q&A. So for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Dave Lucas. I started out as an entrepreneur building businesses in the tech space and some other areas. And I had traded and invested since I was 19 or 20 years old, but I was really more of a dabbler in the markets, like a lot of traders are. Um, and it all changed about 14 years ago. And my wife and I decided to adopt and eventually several years later, travel to bring our daughter Hannah home from China. If anyone has adopted before, especially internationally, you know how much the process takes and you know how much it costs to do everything needed to bring home your child. And at the time I was actually heavily invested and leveraged and I put a huge bulk of my wealth into what became my largest company. Excess cash at the time was hard to come by. And I was determined not to have to quote unquote finance my daughter. So I got back into trading the markets and my goal was to create a strategy that I could do alongside everything else I had going on that could help fund our adoption. And the 12 minute trading strategies are the evolution of that. That's the result today of that. Nowadays, I've been fortunate to sell off some of those businesses, including my largest ones. And I focus my time and attention helping people just like you create financial independence through trading the markets, as well as enjoy spending more time with my family and pursuing one of my great passions, Ironman racing, which I'm uh, ranked top 5% in the world for. In fact, I got to say, it's amazing how uh, racing the world's most prominent endurance races really helped me to become a better trader and cement some of the principles that I'm going to share with you today. So that's me. Doc, tell me a little more about yourself. Okay. Uh, well, you may have heard of me uh, kicking around over the years. Uh, I'm an individual trader and performance coach since 2005, and I was that guy that took a, a perfectly viable six-figure career at a telecommunications company and walked out the door because I absolutely had to do this. Uh, there was no option for me not to do this. So you may have heard of me before at uh, places like Options Linebacker, Options MD, Theo Trade, Docs Trading Tools, or Ready Set Dot Trade. My specialties over the years have been fractal price analysis, options and future strategies, trading mindset because I had to figure out what my own problems were, and then ultimately simplifying the complex. And what I've done through the years is I've written a couple of books here. Uh, Hacking the Holy Grail is about conquering the mental side of trading and understanding that you are the holy grail, not some study, as well as fractal energy trading, which is the strategy that I've been using now for well over 10 years. And both are available on Amazon if you're curious about that. So that is who I am. And I uh, joined up with Dave about a year ago. Actually, we worked uh, 15 years ago together. And this yeah. is uh, this is kind of like a return back to our roots for both of us. So it's been a lot of fun for the past year. Awesome. Thanks, Doc. And, and so Doc and I uh, are going to go off camera uh, while we present the material. And I'll do some work to get his camera sort of when we come back on, because we'll come back at the end for some special announcements and Q&A. But I want to make sure that, uh, you know, camera's not blocking the material or anything for you as we do that. So I'm going to go off camera and we're going to jump into all of this. All right. So here we go. All right. So as I said, we're going to cover why we're here today. We're going to cover a number of different things. And we're going to go in this pattern that you see, right? So we just went through kind of a little bit about us. Next, we'll talk a little bit about why we're here. So here is why we're here. The market transition has been difficult for a lot of traders because most focus on what's behind them. We're always looking in the past. People had just got used to trading the bull in 2021. Then the rug was pulled out going into a bear in 2022. And just when people have gotten used to the high volatility of the bear, We've changed character to a nervous, trendless, choppy market with low to vol volatility. And this is hard on traders because, as I said, most are looking through that lens of the past and what has happened versus what is going to happen and where it's going. And everyone sees the writing on the wall for the recession, the debt ceiling, the slowing economy. But what is actually happening? How do we separate out the narrative from the reality? And if I Think about it this way. If I just gave you a chart, 
You didn't have any context to the outside world, no news, no narrative, no you know economic news, no anything. And I just gave you a chart and where the volatility is at, no outside influence, what market would we be in? And would you know how to trade that market? Would you be able to identify it? Would you know it? It's time for us to remove that noise and focus on the opportunities for the future. Market character changes, and you have to be able to adapt your strategies to maximize your potential in each market, and you have to be able to recognize each market. And this is what we want to do tonight. So we want to really give you the tools to be able to adapt not only to what's happening in the current market, but in the future, so you'll always be ready for those changes in markets. All right, the mental obstacle. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. How many agree that the biggest obstacle in trading, and you can raise your hands on this, you can hit the hand button, it's your biggest obstacle in trading and that governs a lot of trading decisions is fear. In fact, fear is one of the biggest drivers of action for us as human beings in our lives. But most people learn to, they, they really never learn to control or understand how to use it to their advantage. Let me share some stats with you and, and tell me if you relate to them. 80% of all day traders quit within their first two years. Among all day traders, nearly 40% day trade for only one month. Within three years, only 13% continue to day trade. After five years, only 7% remain. The average individual investor underperforms a market index by 1.5% a year. Active traders underperform by 6.5% annually. And day traders with strong past performance go on to earn strong returns in the future, though only about 1% of all day traders are able to predictively profit net of fees. And profitable day traders make up a small proportion of traders, about 1.6% in an average year. After seeing those stats, I can understand how it may be a little discouraging, and many of you can probably relate to some of them. I know I can. I was just like most traders in those stats when I started out. But the real question, and the one that is probably on your mind is, how do I not become just another statistic? How do I succeed? And that's where the mental obstacle has to be overcome. You see, success in trading starts in your mind. Your mind can be your biggest obstacle to success in trading, and it can be your biggest asset. And most traders trade from a position not to lose. They're trading scared, essentially. They let that fear dictate their moves, and it usually ends poorly because they trade on emotion. Your ability to think, separate emotion from logic, set aside the fear-driven responses is your biggest weapon. It's a secret weapon, which once understood, will remove all the barriers to becoming the trader that you aspire to be. Successful traders recognize that trading is an individual business unless you can find a focus wolf pack to run with. More on that a little bit later. Successful traders know that as an individual, you must develop yourself and your mind for success in trading. Successful traders divorce themselves from the herd and tune out the noise from all forms of media. And successful traders use fear as a tool because they accept and understand risk. They use fear as a way to gauge what is happening with risk in the market. They don't let it impact them or control them in their decisions. Successful traders separate that emotion from logic, making decisions in a logic rule-based process. All of you out there have the potential to break through and succeed. We've seen it hundreds of times. But there's actually a narrow pathway to avoid being one of those trader statistics. And I'm excited to turn it over to Doc here to take you through that pathway. So, Doc, go ahead. Okay, so I let's see. We have to turn you off of share screen. Okay, I just did so. You should be able okay. to pick it right up. Share my screen here. Sorry, guys, we're only going to do this once. We are only going to do this once. Let's see. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Yep, we got it. Okay, so this is what I call the seven steps to profits, okay? And getting started here, Dave talked about this narrow path to success in trading. There is only one 
narrow path. I've been doing this for a long time and I've seen lots of people try to be successful at trading. And what I found is there's only one narrow path that you can follow. And the people that follow the path, it's almost like that uh, Mr. Miyagi quote, you know, walk on left side of the road. Okay. Walk on right side of the road. Okay. Walk in the middle of the road, get squished like grape, right? So it's the same kind of thing. You're going to be tempted to wander away from this path many times during your progress because of the way the mind works. It seems simple, simple to stay in the path, but your mind will play tricks with you the whole way. So this is where we get into what we call the trader progression. There is actually a progression from somebody that goes from a novice all the way up to an expert. And I'd like to walk you through that really quickly here. Stage one is what we call mystification. You're brand new. You don't know what how markets work and you view trading as fun and exciting, right? We all start like this. More than likely, you joined in during the end of a bull market, right when things were topping out because everybody's talking about it. So you jump in, you do okay, and guess what? You're unconsciously incompetent. You, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know why you're doing well, but it's fun. Success comes easily and making money seems simple. So you're sizing a Lambo for your garage. You go all in with everything you have and you get crushed when the markets turn. I've seen this happen a million times. Stage two is, right, you get hooked by this. You say, all right, I know what I did wrong, so I want to study this time. You, you start to define your approach and learn how markets move. You wait for your setup, but like touching a hot pot on the stove, you get burned every time you enter, and you start getting timid. You decide that the problem is the strategy and not you. So you keep trying different strategies with the same result. Quite honestly, this is where I see people do this same thing. They'll start a process. They'll take a couple of trades on a different type of strategy. That doesn't work out so well. So they see this bright, shiny penny over here with somebody else's strategy. And they say, hey, that looks really easy. So they go wandering over here, invest into that, take a couple of trades. That doesn't work out either. And so it's the same kind of thing. It, I'd see people doing this all the time, just like running from one strategy to another because it looks easy. And then they find out that it's real hard work. And they often, after a year or two, go right back to where they started in this big circle. So this is what we see all the time. This is stage two hot pot. Now, stage three is where you get angry. Because every time you enter a trade, you lose. You joke with your friends that they should take the other side of your trades, right? Ha ha ha. You're convinced that it's someone else's fault. The Fed, the market makers, the brokers, the gurus, high frequency traders, whatever. You can spot these folks a mile away. Some never exit this stage and eventually quit. You can usually see them on social media barking on their way out the door. Those that survive, the cynical skepticism and realize that there is still some promise for them. Get into the squiggle trader stage. And this is the stage I find the majority of traders stuck in. So chances are pretty good that if you haven't hit this stage yet, you may be stuck here. You buy into the notion that there must be some holy grail study or technique to trading success. If one chart study is good, then eight of them must be better, right? Unfortunately, you have so many competing trailing studies on your chart, you become paralyzed. Analysis paralysis. This is scared money in action. If you get past this point, this is where the magic happens. Stage five is inwardly bound. Traders that survive all of the previous stages have a chance to become consistently profitable if they manage to graduate to the stage. Those in this stage finally understand the holy grail of trading is not some chart pattern, study, or strategy. It's their ability to understand that trading edge starts with them and their ability to think differently from the rest of the investing herd. See, you're not actually trading versus the rest of the market. You're actually trading against yourself. And then eventually stage six is mastery. This is the final stage of progression for a retail trader where they've mastered their setups and especially their reactions to market risk. What Dave talked about is fear. 
Trading is very easy at this level as the trades literally come to them as they wait for their setups. I get asked all the time, can I skip a stage? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm at stage five. I, I don't need all those others. No, you're not. <laughs> I mean, you've got to go through this process because you have to learn along the way why it happens and how to get past it. An expert is a man who's made all the mistakes which can be made in a very narrow field. Great quote. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the seven steps to profitability. How do you fix this? How do you become profitable? So in order to tra traverse to the mastery level, there are what I think are seven steps that one must take. And number one is to think differently about risk. Man, if you want to watch an intense movie, go watch Free Solo and watch Alex Hanold go up the side of El Capitan. He's probably about 3,000 feet above the ground here. No rope, just his hands and feet. That's all. Free Solo. Go watch it. You'll squirm. So think about his vision of risk versus what we think is risk, right? We, we think there's no way you do something like that. But to him, it's a calculated risk. He understands the risk and reward to what he's doing. But all of us are taught through the rules of society that risk is bad. Our parents taught us that risk is bad. But what you have to learn is when you get, and many, many of you, this is the first time you learn about this because you've been in some type of science or engineering career or accounting, and everything is about getting rid of risk. And so all of a sudden you get into trading and all of a sudden there's this risk thing and we, we run away from it. We try to get rid of it. But it's actually your tool. No risk it, no biscuit. Profitable traders don't assign a good or bad title to risk. Risk is just a tool to use as we seek to leverage opportunity. There's literally a river of risk running in front of us in the market and we're gonna just dip our cup in and pull a little bit out and be paid for that risk, but we have to manage it. So think differently about your relationship with risk. That's step one. It's a huge one. Step two, specialize and focus. So you don't have to, to yell this out. You don't have to type this into the chat room. But complete this sentence. Don't put all your eggs in, <clears throat> right? We all know that that sentence is because we're taught that since we're two years old. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Unfortunately, we become a jack of all trades and a master of none because we're taught, well, you must be well diversified. Well diversified in, in our society means to be unfocused and a jack of all trades and a master of none. So the what I found was I had learned a lot of things, but I wasn't profitable. So this was after about 18 months of extremely intense study, and it was like there was nothing else I was doing but this one thing, right? Working on investing. But I wasn't profitable. What is going on here? And what I realized was I had become an expert at entering a lot of different strategies, but not really managing them. And so what I said was, I'm going to pare it down to one strategy, one chart, one setup, one trade. That's it. That's all I'm going to do. And I'm not going to deviate from that until I become profitable at it. So once you've mastered your one thing, then you can worry about diversification. You'd be surprised how fast you can become an expert at something if you focus so focus first, get profitable, and then you can always expand. Step three, define your edge. Most people don't know what an edge if, is. If, if I were to meet you in an elevator and say, you know, we got 30 seconds, and I said, hey, what's your edge in trading? Most people have no idea. Well, um, I'm selling uh, option premium, or I'm using the stochastic oscillator. Nope, that's not good enough you're still part of the investing herd because they're all doing the same thing too. So it's not just enough to use technical indicators and trading strategies. You have to stack the odds in your favor so you become the casino and not just another player. You begin to define your edge when you focus on one thing. That's the secret. Step four, create your plan. You guys have heard this before. If you fail to plan, then plan to fail. What's so important about this is that creating a plan sends an important signal to your subconscious mind that you're serious about this venture 
It's not just a game. You deserve success. Step five, iterate and improve. What does Tiger Woods do when he was uh, number one player in the world? He'd get done with 18 holes, he'd go right to the range. He was unsatisfied. He would continue to iterate until he would master something. So this one step may truly be the holy grail of trading. What I find is that if you start off with goals, determine what your rules are going to be to be able to satisfy those goals, put those into the market, get some kind of results, step back and say, did my goals, were they achieved in my results? Yes or no? If no, what are the corrections that I'm going to make? This is why they put a steering wheel on a car, right? It's, you just don't go straight. So we may even have to revisit our goals and put different rules into place. And eventually what happens is you end up spiraling upwards. This is where the magic lives, guys. This is how to do it. But most of us, we take one or two trades. They're not profitable. We quit. We run off to something else. You've got to find a strategy, that one thing that gives you the rage to master. You must find the rage to master. Step five, iterate and improve. And then step six, build a trader's mindset. I think if you do all the first five steps, you will build a trader's mindset. The field of neuroscience has made incredible steps in progress. It's about building your belief system up. What you focus on expands. If you believe that you can do that, you can do it. If you believe that it's going to be hard, then it will be hard. What we focus on expands. And then step seven, this is what I consider to be today's state of the art in human performance, is we've realized that making small little incremental changes in things can add up to a huge aggregate. If you get 1% better at something every single day, which most people, if I challenge them, hey, can you get 1% better by tomorrow? Sure, I can do that. All right, do it again the next day and the next day and the next day. And you'll be 37 times better at the end of a year. Making lots of small, tiny improvements to performance through habits really adds up over time. Okay, so seven steps to profitability. There will be a quiz at the end of this. Step one, think differently about risk. Step two, specialize and find your one thing. Step three, define your trading edge. Step four, create and maintain your plan. Don't just create it, stuff it up in the shelf, and never see it again. Maintain that plan. Step five, iterate and improve. Step six, build a trader's mindset. These will all happen if you do the first five steps. And then step seven, build tiny gains through better habits. Those will turn into much larger gains. Okay, so those are my seven steps. So we'll take questions at the end of this. Obviously, I'm going to keep charging forward here. I have a little bit of material I'd like to go over. So what Dave talked about was how things are changing in the market and how you know a lot of people are frustrated out there. Right, because they, they start trading one market, then all of a sudden the rug gets pulled out from underneath of them. So many of us trade the market that we wish that we had or the market that we're comfortable with instead of the one that we currently have. If you haven't noticed, markets change their stripes constantly. Retail traders learn a strategy and an approach to the markets that tends to work sometimes, but not at all during the other times, and they don't know why it fails when it does, right? So if you spend any time on social media trading sites, you'll see these waves where a certain style of trading dominates the discussion and then suddenly disappears and is replaced by something else. It goes in waves, and it's usually a trailing wave because it's something that's just about to fail. So my purpose in this section of going over this next few minutes here is to show you the why and how of aligning your approach to the markets based on what character the market is showing us. So there's a, a guy out there, he's been around for a long time. He's an educator in trading called Bill Williams. And this is something, once in a while, you're going to read a nugget that's out there in a trading book, and you may not realize it when you first read it, and it may hit you years later, and this is where it hit me. Like I read this thing back in 2004, I didn't know what he was talking about. And finally it hit me a couple of years ago, want what the market wants. 
want what the market wants. I want you to write it down on a post-it note, put it up on your monitor. Do it now. Want what the market wants. How do we want what the market wants? By figuring out how it's currently behaving and what strategies give us better odds in that environment. And also by understanding the next likely transition that could occur. Hey, we're all experts at this, right? We're all experts at transitions. When it gets dark at night, you know, with a very good probability and certainty that by the next morning, the sun's going to come up again. We're used to these transitions. What we need to do is to figure out how the market transitions. So these are the market seasons. I'm going to go through this very briefly because we're short on time tonight. But the market starts, uh, the four seasons of a market rally is we start with disgust. And then as we get everybody bearish, all of a sudden the market rallies from there. There's disbelief. Nobody can believe it. Hey, it's a sucker's rally. I'm not going to buy into that thing. You can do that. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait until the bear market's over. Well, boof, off it goes. And then finally, everybody's converted. And yeah, okay, it's a, it's a bull market. And eventually what happens is we get into euphoria. If you recognize this, this is the end of 2021, where we got into euphoria. And then we go through the same cycle again, disgust. Those are the four phases to a market cycle. How can we use something like that, though? Notice how all the sections of these markets look completely different from one another. They all look different from each other, don't they? So that we have some sections that are slow, long bull markets. We have some violent corrections to the downside. We have some choppy movements in the middle, choppy stuff there. Here's a nice long bull market. Here's a wild transition of volatility that we saw at the beginning of 22. And then here's an outright bear market that we saw throughout most of 22. So all of these look completely different to each other. And each of these different areas requires a completely different approach to trading. So this is uh, something I've, I have, uh, we, we all borrow things from each other in the world of trading. So I got this from Curtis Faith, who is one of the original turtle traders back from the 1980s, where they just put some random people in a room and said, hey, let's see if we can learn, <laughs> learn you to trade. So this is my matrix. Um, I used to work with GE as a vendor, and they would be able to squeeze everything onto a two-by-two two matrix, and so I'm going to try to do the same thing. So if we look at trend, trend is going to go anywhere on the continuum from sideways or no trend up to trending or lots of trend. And then if we look at volatility, volatility on the continuum is going to be anywhere from quiet up to volatile. So if we combine these, we have four different places where we can group things. We have quiet and sideways markets. We have quiet and trending markets. We have volatile and sideways, and we have volatile and trending. I want you to remember these four because you'll see these at various times. And actually, sometimes you'll see more than these in one year. So quiet and trending is, here's an example of 2017, where it was a beautiful quiet and trending situation, where it just kept going, kind of grinding higher. And each pullback got snapped back up again. This type of market character has been the most prevalent over time. We have positive drift in the markets. This is naturally going to take hold and enforce this type of character through the majority of time. We need to be good at it when it shows. So it's typically an uptrend, choppy in the middle, or parabolic tail. So this is what I see with them. They come strong off the bottom, choppy in the middle, and then they usually squeeze up to a parabolic tail at the very end. Range expansion, range contraction, repetition. So markets move in a very repetitive format. They expand, they contract, they expand, they contract. They go back and forth like that. It's not overbought, oversold. Pullbacks are quiet, methodical. They work perfectly. The market climbs the wall of worry. Nobody can understand why the market's going higher because it makes no sense, right? Because maybe the economy is in, in the tank or something like that. The market's going higher. They typically will climb the wall of worry. Very low implied volatility with excitement. Every time you see a red candle, like, here it is. Here's the one. Option sellers don't have much room, 
and it ends in a runaway market at the very top with low information traders leading that market. So we'll see quiet and trending the majority of the time, or at least to this point in history. I don't know if it's going to change pretty soon here. Okay, so this is a musical chairs type of market. This is the time to be as long as you possibly can. The very end of the move is when it's obvious. This is when you should be getting more defensive, when you see the markets going like this, and when you see your barber giving you advice, you should be getting more defensive and not dogpiling on. So what kind of strategies can we use for this? Long delta strategies. If you don't know what those are, stick around. Iron condors can work, but you have to go out several months in time to get enough room. There's not much volatility to sell. An overall long delta portfolio will help smooth out the upside pressure, allow you to relax so you don't have to stress out with every red candle. Time spreads can also be very, very useful because they're very good with low implied volatility. Use the linear nature of the price movement to employ pullback and breakout swing trades. These can be set up through automated scans and broker APIs. The best time to play defense is during times of peace. So when markets are doing this, start getting defensive. Don't wait until the market does that. It's too late. You've already missed your opportunity. Play defense during times of peace and not war. The longer that the bull plays out, the more defensive you should become. This can become very difficult at the top as you'll feel like you're the only person doing so. You'll feel like you're alone when you start becoming defensive at the top. The greatest gains will be made at the very bottom and at the very top of the move. So the most of the gains will come at the very end, which is why it's so hard to let go of that thing. But you got to prepare for chaos. It's impossible to spot the very top of a market move. I don't care how good you are. Most traders prepare for this too early. They get discouraged. They give up right before the transition. They start buying puts and they go in the tank. Each one of them goes to waste. And so you stop doing it right before eventually it goes down. So consider doing things like stock replacement with fixed risk calls. So trade in your stock, buy some calls and see if they'll just run for you. So you have fixed risk on them and you're not holding on to long portfolio. This is very difficult to do when things are flying. Now we get to what we saw at the very beginning of 2022, which was a transition to sideways and volatile character. And here at the beginning of 2018, we saw it here at the beginning of, this was in uh, the end of 2018, we saw this as well too. So we've seen this several times. But markets that do this kind of thing, where they go into quiet and trending, will always transition into sideways and volatile. It enters via an uptrend. It starts with what I call a shot over the bow, big red candle. All of a sudden, everybody is freaked out by this big red candle. Where did that come from? Realize volatility is orders of magnitude larger than quiet and trending. The VIX will normally spike on initial move down and surprise. And subsequent moves down will result in lower highs in the VIX. Much higher implied volatility to start eventually will normalize. So the majority of the time, this character is the launching point for the next quiet and trending move. So the way this works is typically we have quiet and trending, flames out, goes into a big corrective pattern like this, sideways and volatile. And if we are still in a secular bull, it will eventually find its way back into the next quiet and trending. Occasionally, it'll be a gateway transition to a full bear, exactly what happened in 22. Started in April of 22. It's a shock to the system. The market will turn on a dime from quiet and trending to extremely rapid distribution. So if you've been paying attention during the latter stages of quiet and trending, you were preparing for this moment. We were doing that exactly that in 2021. We didn't know it was going to go into a bear but we knew that we were expecting bigger volatility. So what do you do for trading strategies in volatile and sideways? I don't advocate the opposite of quiet and trending. So you don't want to turn into a bear. It's you've got to be you've got to be in it to win it. You've got to be much much different personality and setup 
strategies to be effective as a bear, as a fully committed bear. You can't be a part-time bear. It doesn't exist. You know, so you see stories of bears like Michael Burry and how they made billions during periods like this, but you have to be way early, be willing to take lots and lots of heat for a long period of time and take a lot of abuse from your friends. You have to be 100% committed to doing that. It's not easy to do this. So never chase a move lower. So if something turns, right, so if we get something like this, turning lower, never chase after it. Hey, how do I buy puts? No, you should be selling puts down here. You're too late. You're too late. You got to be in it to win it. My approach during this character is to assume that it's going to be a correction that may take a few months to work out. So I'm going to look at this as saying, all right, this is going to be 10% maybe to begin with. And it may take a few months to work out. It's not going to instantly fix it. So many people see the big pullback jumps up here, pulls down, and they say, here's the dip. I'm going to buy the dip because this thing is ready to go again. Nope, takes a few months. So it's it takes a while to work this stuff. If it deepens into a bear, you'll know it. You'll start to see lower highs and lower lows on the weekly chart. Playing these massive swings up and down can be a lot of fun. <laughs> it can be very profitable. So you'll likely miss the first one but you can always catch up. So clear your trash on the bounce back up. So if we transition into something like this, clear your longs on the bounce back up. So if you've got longs that were taking a lot of heat down here and you don't really, not really sure if they're going to survive anymore, wait until the next move back up, clear your longs. You can always get back into them if you need to. So get set for the next plunge when it seems like the coast is clear and everybody breathes a sigh of relief. It takes a long time for these things to work themselves out. So I like long iron condors. Long iron condors, they're the opposite of short iron condors. These, these are where we want the movement. I use out-of-the-money debit spreads with asymmetric reward to risk. Out-of-the-money calendar spreads can be used, but they're tricky. You can sell puts at the bottom of a move or use modified long synthetics on deep sell-offs. Play the bounce back up to the upside. Don't be afraid of that. So make sure you lay out a price or technical achievement that will signal the volatile sideways characters potential, potentially transitioning back to quiet trending or, for that matter, to a bear. Normally, this is done through price action. So Dave will talk about price action in just a minute here. But you also have to prepare for the converse to occur, a transition into a full bear, which is our next character. Okay, so here is, here's a transition from quiet and trending. We transition, we get, we get noisy, we get volatile, and then all of a sudden it gets real right here. This actually was where Jerome Powell said, hey, I think I'm going to be raising rates for a long time to come. And the market said, oh, Oh, so much for that transitional inflation. Goodbye. So we nav we we transitioned into a bear market right there. It wasn't exactly obvious at the time, but it was um, yeah, just a little over a year ago, in April of two, 2022. So here's the characteristics for volatile and trending. It enters via a volatile and sideways. Almost always, 2020 was I would say not really. That, to me, wasn't a bear market. That was a correction. Very deep one. Starts breaking polarity with lower highs and lower lows. Realize volatility is about the same. It doesn't change. It just it starts trending down. Very irregular, very nonlinear movement. It's chaotic. VIX will stay steady or elevated unless we see a big waterfall decline. I have not seen one of those in a long time. I haven't seen a big waterfall decline like this in a long, long time. Actually, the closest that we had was the pandemic bottom to that. So IV will stay elevated or high, eventually will recede even as price goes lower. So you'd be surprised to see how, like if you study bear markets, um, people get bored with them. So even as the price goes down and down and down, the volatility starts to recede. Eventually will be a launching point of the next quiet and trending move higher. Right now, we're actually wondering if this is what's happening in our current market today. Majority of the candles are green. 
Believe it or not, in a bear market, the majority of the candles are green. Most people don't know that. So we've seen some very rapid, volatile, and trending characters over the past few years, which I would actually characterize as more of a deep correction, like the pandemic move. A true bear market will last on average 18 months. It will totally wear you out unless you embrace and enjoy the character while it lasts. 2022 was tough for a lot of people. So every true bear that I've ever seen or experienced always has the very worst selling at or near the eventual bottom. 2008 had an October crash, drifted lower for another five months. Tech Bubble had lots and lots of these. So what do we do for volatile and trending? The same thing really as volatile and sideways. Keep your eyes peeled for the bottom. Your job is to remain liquid up until the final move lower. Don't get destroyed. So once you see a true volatility at event, you can start to nibble on long bargains. You will not want to do so because you've been conditioned to stay away from scary stuff. But this is where you have to start to embrace the risk. So if you're concerned, then stick to selling puts on assignable index products, right? If the spiders ever go to zero, we have bigger problems, don't we? So iron condors during volatile and trending might be difficult if the IV percentile is not high enough. Very easy to get run over in either direction due to the increased emotions. And you can consider looking for brief periods of consolidation and selling low probability iron condors or even iron butterflies. We'll get into that in just a minute here. Your goal is to get your fair share and get flat as soon as possible. Okay, so quiet and sideways is actually something that we hardly ever see and we have just recently seen during the month of May. Usually enters via quiet and trending. Relatively rare, but we've seen this in the month of May. Marked by very tight range of price action. IV is usually mid-range, which is the case right now. Can be somewhat unnerving to trace because the energies are sky high and you're constantly expecting a move that never comes. When is it going to break out? We're going through that right now, aren't we? Usually exits this character via a volatility event. So typically what we see is we see it go sideways and then we see it go bam like that. That's usually how these things exit the quiet and sideways. So it's musical chairs. As long as the music keeps playing, you can keep trading these strategies. It'll keep printing railroad tracks forever until something knocks it out of the range. Iron condors and time spreads are great for this, but just know that eventually it will end poorly when the music stops. So low probability condors, we'll discuss these in a minute, are a great approach since they decay quickly. The eventual risk is known and acceptable. So I want to close here with transitions. Think about transitions through the seasons, right? So just like the seasons transition, just like night transitions today, there's different transitions for market character. So there is order in the chaos. Fortune favors the prepared understanding the difference between the two, okay? So new to retail traders experience the chaos. It's a completely different experience to be looking at markets through a different lens. I am going to send you back to Dave now. Thanks, Doc. Jumping back over to mine, and everybody should be able to see it. Doc, can you see it? Yeah, we got tools for today. Perfect. So we're going to jump into tools for today. Great job, Doc. I always love when you go through that. Is it's just such a great reminder every single time. And, you know, all of you watching, if that's your first time, when you get the recording of this, go back and watch that several times. That is a masterclass in markets and how to trade them. So thanks, Doc. Um, so tools for today. So this is kind of interesting. People are like, oh, what's a tool? Is it an indicator or is it, you know, some sort of magical uh, chart pattern or something like that? When I look at tools, I look at them in a... Uh, from a number of different angles, right? And in this section, Doc and I are each going to share our best tools and methods because a method can be a tool on how to succeed in different markets. And in some cases, they're universal across all those different markets that you did see. So my tool that I want to cover and one that people ask me about all the time is they, a lot of people ask me like, how did you figure out and come up with the strategies that you do? 
um, people initially are skeptical when we talk about having an over 90% win rate with the trades. And when they go look at the history and everything else, they're like, wow, like, how did you come up with this? Because you're over 90%, right? So in, in trading the markets over the last 20 years, figuring out a lot of what I've already shared, I, I've realized several things. First, one of the best tools is the strategy with clearly defined rules that gives a really solid and consistent edge. And so I want to show you kind of how I learned the power of this, you know, simplicity, if you will. Um over a very few important realizations. So first, if you think about it, if you buy a stock or an option, how do you make money? It's not a trick question, right? For a stock, it has to go up. For an option, it's gotta go in the direction that you bought it for. For example, if you buy a call, the underlying has to go up. If you buy a put, it has to go down. But if you think about it further, a stock or an underlying can go three ways. It can go up, down, or stay the same. So. Really, that means that just straight up buying a stock or an option without any edge, without any strategy, just going to the market, straight up buying a stock or an option gives you a 33% chance of making money. Now, to put that in perspective, the odds of winning a hand in a blackjack table at the casinos in Vegas are 46.36%. So you're literally better off taking your money to the casino versus just buying a stock or an option, especially if you've got no strategy, no rules, no edge. And a lot of people, I mean, every day, right? We looked at those trader stats. Why do you think those stats are what they are? That's what people are doing, right? They just, they have a hunch and they go buy, you know, uh, a stock or an option or whatever, right? So once I realized this, once I realized this, I, I asked myself, well, who has the 67% chance of winning? Because that's who I want to be. And it's the sellers. And at first it was discouraging because being a seller meant that you either had to be like bringing a company to market, doing an IPO on an exchange or an accredited investor participating in an IPO. And at the time I was not able to do either. But as I investigated more, I found several types of options trades that allowed me to be the seller and put the odds in my favor of 67% just by choosing those types of trades. Now think about that. You're laying 67% chance of winning just by the trade you choose to do, right? Now, that's really awesome. Those trades are naked puts, cover calls, and credit spreads. And so today, my strategies and systems are all built around massively stacking the odds in my favor, starting with the base of 67% and going up from there, right? And creating cash flow from the markets with as little effort as possible, making the most as possible. And I really do it in three steps. So step one is, as I just talked about, put the 67% odds in your favor before you ever make a trade, right? Real traders know how to find and maximize an edge. And that is what this is all about here at 12-Minute Trading. So I only sell options because it turns me into that house. I'm not the gambler, right? I'm basically selling to the suckers in the casino. And the house, over time, always wins. Additionally, when you sell something, I like it because you get paid, right? I'm always getting paid up front to take on any risk. And then lastly, selling gives me control. As you're going to see in just a few minutes, I'm going to walk through and kind of peel back the layers on my double-double strategy that I do. I don't have to be right in calling a stock market direction or you know any of that type of stuff. I play in the margins where the others don't. Step two, increase those odds by having a solid tested set of rules for entry, defense, and exit, right? So over the years, we've developed specific criteria to enter trades. It helps me maximize my trades, giving me that, that high win rate over 90%. And I, and you guys know, I track and share the trades going all the way back to 2013. It's a laundry list in there, but with over a 90% win rate, that still means you're going to have less than one in 10, you know, have an issue or get in danger of being attacked. And so while that happens rarely, I've got a whole set of defensive management and rules that I employ that helps really ensure that I stay profitable. And then lastly, I have clear targets for exit that I stay disciplined with. And then step three, I focus on consistent cash flow through base hits, not home runs, right? So I, I do that and I just achieve them over and over again. And those base hits add up to home run like returns over time, um, making for a more consistent cash flow business versus kind of that typical roller coaster ride of like winning big on a trade, then giving it all back on the next and, and so on, like a lot of traders experience, like Doc uh, talked about in the stages of the trader, right? And so in the end, like I've proven that these strategies can and do win over 90% of the time, even in bear markets. In fact, as many of my students know, year to date and, and you know, even last year, we had one double double trade that actually got in trouble. And to date, we haven't had any issues, right? For this year. And so um, not one losing trade so far this year. And really that's the power of selling options because you don't have to be right 
you don't have to call a direction and you don't have to hope for it to work out, right? Hope's not a strategy for anything. You can make money no matter what the market does, no matter which way a stock or an index goes. And being armed with the knowledge that Doc just shared about changing market patterns, it helps you be able to adjust these trades to take advantage of those markets, right? And you can do it in just a few minutes a day. For some strategies, a lot of people know, uh, I trade just once a week to achieve my goals. And so with that said, I want to share a few more major realizations that have directly contributed to the success of the system and, and this trading strategy and myself as a trader. So the first is, and Doc alluded to this a little bit earlier, I'm going to show something similar to his, but traders make things much more complicated than they need to be. And I think it's a trade of human nature in general, but I found that the more simple you can make a trading strategy, the more successful you'll be. I think Einstein said it best when said, make things simple, but not simpler. So when I show the double double in just a few minutes, I think you're gonna understand this a little bit better, but Doc showed something like this earlier, right? Anybody ever have a trade chart that looks like this or a screen that looks like this? I used to, right? This used to be me in the early days of trading. I thought the more indicators that I could stack on that chart, right? The squiggle trader stage, the smarter I was, better edge that I had over others. But you know, what I, what I found was I was stuck in that stage. Right. And doc kind of gave me that description of it earlier. And you just, you stack so much onto charts that you become paralyzed with so many inputs, you can't make a decision. Right. And so it's not, a, it's, it's not about the complexity of it. The more complex something is, doesn't mean it's better. In fact, the simpler that it is it's better. Right. I'm sure a lot of people, uh, you guys listening can relate to that. Right. Everybody's looking for that Holy grail chart setup, or that, that methodology. And, and, I, and I'm here to tell you, it, it just doesn't exist out there. The closest thing to the Holy Grail, as we kind of talked about at the beginning, is between your ears, your control over your mind, your emotions, fear, all of that. And so that brings me to the next one. And, you know, it's really the more indicators that we put on that chart, the harder it is to trade successfully. And so find the few that really hold true through the different markets that, that can work in them and the different changing characters and stick to those right? The last one is the more often we trade, especially based on emotion, we lose. The last, you know, uh, last week or so, I had a conversation with a, a student that was jumping from different strategies to different strategies, trying all these different ones without a plan, without really uh, a uh, solid strategy behind them. And they were trading like crazy and they were just churning, right? They weren't making anything, right? And so when you trade, uh, based on really emotion and just fear and, and like moving trades around, right? Even sacrificing your rules because fear gets the best of you. And you guys know it, you know, the hair stands on your neck. You kind of get that, that shaky type feeling when you see the chart going against you and all of a sudden your position is underwater or, you know, that type of stuff. You know, when you abandon those rules in the setup because of emotion and feeling, you're going to make more mistakes and you're going to enter more trades to fix those mistakes, causing you to exacerbate the problem and lose more. So, the biggest winner in all of that <laughs> is just your broker making money off trade commissions and fees. Um, and so for me, a long time ago, I, I paired it all back and I said, what really works? What can I count on? And it's market energy, it's fractal energy, it's Bollinger Bands, and it's price action. And so I'm going to show you just real quick on a chart. I'm just going to take you through, for those who have never seen me do it, just how I, I use these and why they're so important. So let me uh, share a trade screen real quick. There we go. Everybody should be able to see uh, a screen of the SPX up here. Uh, it's going to be a little different tomorrow. looks like NVIDIA might have uh, saved the market a little bit. We'll see where the market opens. Uh, but down here is the fractal energy line. Now, mine looks a little different than Doc's. I've kind of customized it, programmed it over the years to kind of give me some signals. Yellow is when we're on the bottom Bollinger Band and we're fully charged. Pink or at the top uh, Bollinger Band and fully charged. And then the kind of pink or magenta is when we're at either the bottom Bollinger Band and uh, exhausted or upper Bollinger Band and exhausted. So that's just a signal. It's just basically telling me, hey, this is a situation you want to look at, right? And so I love the Bollinger Bands. And the reason I love the Bollinger Bands is because they act like the ropes in a boxing ring. You think about a boxer, they're boxing, they get thrown against the ropes, the ropes bend, they throw the boxer back into the ring, but they don't break, right? They bend, they don't break. And so anytime that you see the uh, chart or the price start to come down to the Bollinger Band level, it's getting to a point where it's going to get thrown back in. That doesn't mean it won't keep going in that direction, but it can't sustain trying to go out outside the Bollinger Bands. It gets thrown back in. And so that's why you can see like here, it got thrown back in, had to keep continuing. Now, the other thing in conjunction with this is the energy, right? So when I see like 
bottom Bollinger band like this and fully charged, right? So we, we charged back up in this case, we came out, we charged back up, we went up and then gave it, gave it back, right? Right into here and got into where we were exhausted um, or not exhausted, but fully charged and at the bottom Bollinger band, then we burned that energy and we headed back higher. Right. And we even pulled back a little bit in there as we did that. Same as when we're on the bottom Bollinger band, right. And, and going back the other way. Here's a good example of where we're near the upper Bollinger band. We're exhausted. So it's really hard to keep trending in that direction. And so one of the fastest ways to pull back, uh, to charge back the energy is to pull back right? Go or go the opposite way you came. So in this case, right, we were up near the upper Bollinger band, we got to exhaustion. And what's the easiest way to charge this chart, pull back from there, got charged back up. And then that's brought us into this sideways action that we've been in. And, and this right here looked like the release, right? So it's interesting, Doc was talking about these, these sideways markets, they the energy can coil up and coil up, and you're looking for that big move, right? And so it's, one of those things we thought we got early in the week, right? And it started to bleed out, but then we got the last few days, right? We got this debt ceiling thing. We got some big risk event that comes in. And so we still have gone nowhere. And this energy is still at 50. And guys, anytime you're in the 50 to 60 range or above, you're charged up and ready to go. You can trend. Anytime you're at that 35, 30 or below, you're pretty exhausted and it's hard to keep trending in that direction. And so that's what I look for. I look for these times where, you know, we've got, a, a bottom kind of put in on the Bollinger Band. We're we're kind of low on energy, right? You can sell like a, a put into that or a put spread into that. Then it runs away from you and goes to the other side, right? And then you can sell the call the other way, right? Um, and, or the call spread, right? And so you can use the energies and the Bollinger Bands in conjunction with the price to really help you be able to time entries and stuff. And I, my students know going into this week, right? Um, we talked about the NDX, right? We got some trades on the NDX and it was running. It was, in fact, it's a different looking chart. Let me pull up the NDX. And you can see this chart was, was just, you know, there's that parabolic. Remember doc just talked about it, right? Parabolic. And it burned out the energy. And so, as I said to students, hey guys, this thing is out of energy. It's just gone parabolic. This is about the end for it. Expect to pull back here. Right. And we don't need to do anything with our trade. That's a little bit of, you know, up around, I think, 14,300. It expires next week. And I said, let it, we're going to let that go and pull back. And now that trade is profitable, we may even exit in the next day or so, depending on, on the movement. Right. And so this energy, it's hard for it to continue. It's got to pull back. And you can see what's happening. It's pulling back. It's starting to charge itself back up. Right. So this was a textbook example of being fully charged, lower Bollinger Band, and then releasing that energy. And all of what Doc talked about, right, from the um, disbelief, right, disbelief, and or sorry, the disgust, the disbelief, acceptance, euphoria in just a few weeks in a chart pattern right there pulled back. And now we're probably going to pull back, continue to walk sideways, may drop a little bit more, but this is going to take some time to charge itself back up. So that's how you can read price. You can read chart patterns using just a few indicators, um, you know, with, with relative ease, right? Especially with the knowledge of things that we've just shared. And this is all I need. This is all I trade off of for my trades. So hopefully that gives you a little insight, gives you a little inside baseball to how I look at things, how I do it, how I simplify with stuff. Um, and uh, you can use that for you as well. Um, okay. So with that being said, you should be able to see the screen again, right? Yes, we are back on that. And so summing it up for me, choosing to sell options, I put the odds in my favor at 67%. I increased those odds to over 90% through how I enter and manage trades, including using my proprietary indicators and time-tested rules. I effectively become the house selling to the suckers in the casino, creating cons consistent cash flow from the markets. And I do it typically less than 10, 12 minutes a day. And guess what? You can do it too. I had to work in a good old Rob Schneider cameo in there somewhere. So hopefully you're starting to see the power of looking at trading this way. Uh, I'll share more in a few minutes, but first doc, you have a few tools that uh, you've got up your sleeve that you want to share. So go ahead. Okay. So one of the tools that we have is, uh, is actually daily options have come along and we started to, this started to happen about 2005 as we got weekly options. So you have to understand like 20 years ago, all we had were the monthly options where you had these great big things that, you know, <laughs> we didn't get, but once every four to five weeks. And so they started to slip in the Friday options with weeklies. Those were great. 
And then one by one, we've gotten Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then finally last year we got Tuesday and Thursday as well too. So now we have five days a week of these daily options. And we have those on the SPX, the Spiders, the Qs, the NDX. There's a couple of other instruments out there as well too, especially like the ES and even the MES and now the Micros are starting to do what we call daily options. So this gives us the potential to fine tune our strategies to what's happening now. So this is one of the tools that we're using. Go ahead, Dave. Okay, so one of the things that we we also do is we don't like to get into the religious wars of, you know, whether technical analysis is good or bad, because we don't use it to predict the future. We just understand what it's telling us, and it sets up a framework for us to make decisions. The other thing that we can do is we can also use the random walk methodology to understand the probabilities behind something. So we will use every tool at our disposal. So it doesn't matter whether what religion somebody is is trading with, right? Whether they're random walk or technical analysis. And it's kind of funny because like in Chicago, everybody is random walk. They all do everything by probability. And if you if you ever go through the CBOE, you will not see one price chart in the entire building. It's You'll be banned from the place if they ever <laughs> catch you looking at a chart. But, you know, to me, that's ridiculous. You know, why don't you use every tool available to you at your disposal? So these two schools of thought, why not use both of them? So that's what we do with everything that we do. We're doing everything based on probability as well as the, using the technical edge. All right, next slide, Dave. Okay, so uh, so we're going to initiate our range-bound options offense when conditions appear likely to consolidate or reverse, like what Dave talked about. And we will pause when conditions appear favorable to trend. So when it's all wound up, like a spring and getting ready to move, this is where we have to be a little bit more cautious. So we'll also take care to avoid trading before big economic announcements, you know, whether it's a Fed day, we got PCE coming up on Friday, which could be important. But then we'll trade after them to help propel the trade further in distance. We'll use that move to help slingshot the position out there. We'll place positions outside of the statistical expected move and known support and resistance price level. So we use both of those different competing levels of, of analysis. We'll place positions that strike prices that correlate to a specific probability or delta. So we're very precise about we will, where we will place our positions. We do the same thing every time that we can. So we want to do everything that we can before we enter positions to stack the probabilities in our favor, right? So why put yourself into a, you know, stack those probabilities before you enter and not after. So there's 252 trading days a year. We do not need to enter every single day. Go ahead, next slide. All right, that brings it back to me for strategies for today, just to uh, say that's the next one we're going on, but it's Doc strategies to start. So go ahead, Doc. Okay, so I'm going to walk you guys through, and and Dave, you, you can go ahead and flip through these really quick. So what I want to show you is kind of the continuum of an income strategy. And it starts off with the king of options selling strategies, which is the short strangle. So on those shoulders, on the blue line there, those are where we're selling on the left side, selling a naked put. And on the right side, selling a naked call. This is the king of options selling strategies. The problem with the short strangle is the huge margin required due to the unlimited risk profile. You can't see it there, but that risk goes unlimited all the way down to <laughs> infinity on the right-hand side and down to zero, right? So it's, it's huge. So this is something that you don't want to tangle with unless you're really, really good with this. So the next version of this is the high probability iron condor. So what we do is we add an insurance option on the, the end of these way out there in distance. And so we cap our margin. So this is where we use the spread. 
So for this style of iron condor, probability is increased by using a lower reward to risk. So these are typically where we're getting like the really, really way out of the money options that we're selling, maybe like a five delta, four delta, something like that. You can think of this almost as kind of like the artillery in an army where it's way, way, way behind the lines and they're under no threat whatsoever. They just lob shells over the lines and that's kind of the way it is, right? So most of the time, these positions are not threatened at all, but they have no rear guard around them. So the next version of this, though, is what I call a low probability iron condor. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring the wings in, maybe to about a 25 delta, and this is going to turn it into a 50-50 or one-to-one -one reward to risk. 50% probability of success to begin with. Now, you may say to yourself, like, why on earth would you do something like that? That makes no sense. That's insanity, right? That's, you know, financial suicide to bring in the probabilities. But I would disagree. So for this style of iron condor, we've decreased the probability. However, we're using a much higher reward to risk. What I want you to think about is if you've ever held a high probability iron condor overnight and you have an event happen which causes, let's say, a uh, futures to be <laughs> um, the circuit breakers kick on. So similar to what we had back in 2020 or during the 2016 election or during Brexit or any of those events when you have circuit breakers firing, because the S&P has moved 7% overnight. Those are not fun to hold any kind of out of the money, low pro or high probability setup with that because you're taking massive amounts of heat. With a low probability condor, this is my sleeping iron condor because I don't care what happens to this because the reward to risk is great with these. Look, I can have you know an 800 point move against there. I know exactly what my risk is. So this is a great trade for also for a speed perspective because they, they do burn premiums so much faster than the ones that are way out of the money. Okay, and we can take it even one step further to the next slide, the iron butterfly, where we actually collapse the iron condor to uh, the short options are right on top of each other. And this is even faster. So what we've done is we've sacrificed width for speed. So think about this, like most people were just don't, you know, they, they think there's only one version of iron condor. There's actually several different types and it's all the variation on the original king of option strategies, the strangle. So we're gonna use one of these different types of strategies depending on what it is that we wanna accomplish in our trades, whether it's speed or whether it's reward to risk, or whether we think that we can get away with a very, very wide trade and we don't have the volatility to deal with it. Okay, next slide. So here's my point, guys. You don't need to learn 42 different fancy sounding option strategies. That used to be a thing way back when, of like, well, you know, you need, you know, like Batman's tool belt, you need to have all the tools available to your disposal, just like a professional. I got news for you, professionals only trade just a handful of them and they know how to massage them, they know how to manage them, adjust them, but they start with something very, very simple. Just a handful of these very properly applied, correctly managed strategies will work to create consistent income provided you manage them properly. So you're becoming an insurance company by taking risk out of the market, you're being paid for it, by those that want to offload their risk, you're providing a very valuable service. And that's how we're gonna end or earn that daily income. So here's an example of something that we do. This is a delta neutral or a low probability iron condor. So you'll notice that it's a one-to-one. -one. This is using a tasty trade. I guess they're called now tasty trade. So this is uh, again, better static risk management protection against black swans. So here's a recent trade that we took. We got in for a 250 credit with a $5 wide spread. So we're risking 250 to make 250. And we'll typically take our fair share out at over 10%. So this one actually did slightly better than target. 
at 205 debit, where we get almost a 14% return on risk after commissions, just, uh, just held it over the weekend. Typical hold time is about two days. So if I enter, say like on a Tuesday morning, I'm usually out of the trade either by the next afternoon or maybe the next morning. So 48 hours. So usually some sometime between 36 and 48 hours, this trade is firing. And we can always adjust it. If we, if we step in front of a trend, we can adjust it. We can bring the risk down from 250, usually down to about 90 if we have to. So this offers great resilience against black swans. I've said that about three or four times now, but <laughs> newer traders always want to know how much money you can make. The more experienced traders will always say, well, wait a minute, let's start with how much you can risk. All right, Dave, next slide. And I think this might be my last one here. So performance since we moved to this style of trade, since the market changed, right? So we, the market changed, we moved our strategies, we adjusted, we're flexible. Since we moved to this style of trade on February 3rd, the win rate has been 96.3% with a 5.32 profit factor. For every dollar that we lose through trades, we win 532. That's an ATM, guys. Anything above 1.5 means you're printing money. Excellent. Awesome, Doc. All right, guys. I want to be conscious of time. Um, we're going to have to go over by a little bit from where we started. No, no, uh, uh, you know, surprise probably there. Um, I'm going to go through some things on the double double strategy that I do. This is a strategy that's a high probability strategy that really I've designed to do to create monthly income in really just about any market. You can trade these through the different market characters that you have seen tonight. Um, Entry is a little different in those characters, right? Um, you may wait one side or the other, and I do that based upon what's happening in that. But um, of the five different strategies that I employ as part of the advisory service that I do, you know, this one is, is really one of my favorites, right? So I'm going to go through this very quickly because we want to get some of these announcements we have for you at the end. But, um, but I think you'll kind of get, uh, uh, some of what Doc talked about, some of what I talked about earlier about simplifying in this and how to really set yourself apart with that edge. So th this is an iron condor strategy. It stacks the odds in your favor for income over four weeks or less. My target returns 4% on it. I trade it every week. Trades are set up on Sunday evenings. Typically, although with the events that we've been having, I've been waiting, right? Uh, lately, students know that. Um, I'm doing it during the week because you can do it any time during the week. Um, it doesn't have to be done on Sunday, but typically their setup is good to cancel orders and they typically fill, you know, once they're set up, whether it's during market hours or Monday on the AM, the actual time I'm in the trade is only 2.1 weeks. So why is it called double, double It's designed to double the trading capital allocated to the strategy in the course of the year. So simple math, if you're making 4% minimum return on risk every two weeks, that compounds to a little over hundred percent, but obviously that's the goal, right? As I mentioned, 90 plus percent historical win rate, that means that not every trade is going to work out. And some will you know, close early for, you know, uh, maybe limiting risk, things like that. But how many of you guys would be happy with 70% return, 50%, heck, maybe even a 30% return on your money in the course of a year, spending, you know, 10, 12 minutes a week to set up those trades? So let's talk about how these trades work. Um, I set these up on the indexes. So SPX, NDX, RUT, SPY. Uh, IWM, Qs, DIA. Um, this is a chart of SPX from February timeframe. Uh, we were pretty volatile back then. And the setup that I'll show is a real trade from February that I closed at profit target. So one of the things um, that we've done over the last few years that's been just really awesome is working with our mastermind group, other professional traders. We've done an exhaustive analysis on the max movement in a given time frame for each index. So I know the max move up or down over the last five years for all the indexes from timeframes of one day to one week, month, and so on. So if you remember, I talked earlier about increasing those odds, not just by selling options, but by rules for ending the trade, this is part of increasing those odds. So I look for the chart that allows me to place my trade outside those max move levels and still pay me my 4% return on risk. Um, and so we talked about the Bollinger Bands earlier. I like to place it outside of those if I can as well, because those are natural barriers, right? Those are natural support and resistance level. And so um, 
if I can set them outside the max move levels, the double tra uh, double double trades, and outside the Bollinger Bands, that's always a win win for me. So as you can see on the SPX uh, chart on the screen, the upper Bollinger Band is about forty one fifty, and the lower is thirty five seventy three. I trade the Iron Condor, and for those of you that don't know what an Iron Condor is, it's simply selling a call spread and a put spread on a stock or an index that's the same size width and in the same cycle. Um, for example, this trade was sold for the February twenty eighth cycle. It was about four weeks out in trading days when I did it. Used a 10 wide iron condor on the SBX, meaning that my risk was $1,000 per contract. And remember, my goal is to make 40 bucks per contract. That's what I want to make. That's why it's called a high probability, right? Because it's way out of the money. And I do different sizes of these each week, ranging from 10 to 50 wide. And since I know that I need to be outside the weekly chart Bollinger Bands and also outside the max move parameters, which you can see on the screen are 4336 at this time and 3618 on the put side, my job is to see if there's that setup that allows me to do that and get that 4% net credit after trading costs and all of that. And so when I looked at the options change, you can see for February 28th, I was able to sell the 3565 by 3575 put spread. And it gave me about $35, which is right, you know, and it's right at that 3573 lower Bollinger Band on the weekly chart. Also well below that 3618 level based on the max move data. You'll also notice that although my target on the trade is to make 4% or 40 bucks, I'm selling the Condor and I'm getting $35 on this one side. Um, remember, I still have the other side to sell and get paid on. That's one of the benefits of the Iron Condor, and I'll expand a little bit more on that in a second. But first, let's discuss the call side. So on the call side, I was able to sell the 28 February 43.50 by 43.60 call spread, and I got 35 bucks for that as well. And it was well above the 41.50 upper Bollinger Band at the time and above the 43.36 level based on that max move data. So as with the put side, although my target is to make that 4%, I'm selling this side and I'm getting paid 35 bucks as well. So my total credit was $70 per contract or 7% return on risk per $1,000 contract, right? And that's the beauty of the on your condor is you can profit off the same risk on both sides. A lot of people will sell just put spreads or call spreads. And I, and I do this um, and they can do really well in trending markets, right? But they're missing the leverage of the condor allowing them to profit from the same amount of risk on both the top and bottom side. And the broker still only sets aside the $1,000. They don't do it twice. And the reason being, if you think about it, is you can't lose on both sides uh, at expiration, right? So if you can't lose on both sides, you don't have double the risk. You just have the single risk. And that's another form of leverage that allows you to make more in a trade. And finding leverage in trading is one of those secrets to building an edge. So I like to get... 70 to $80 per 10 wide iron condor uh, in the double double strategy, sometimes a little bit more than that. It allows me to exit earlier by using some of that extra credit to buy back the trade early at my profit target and then turn around and put that money back to work in a new trade. And that's why the average time that I'm in these is about 2.1 weeks instead of the four weeks that I've sold it out to. Each day that that price is not up the strikes of the condor because they're an option trade, and they have time limits to which they expire, they're losing value. And after a couple of weeks or so, I can buy them back for 10, 20 cents, exiting that trade early and ensuring my 4% or more goal. And once I'm in the trade, there's not that much for me to do, but really let time work on it until it exits per my orders. Yeah, these things are designed to withstand, you know, 10 plus percent moves in the span of four weeks, right? And so, of course, I've got trade management rules, defensive rules that I can use to ensure that success if I need to. But, um, you know, I, I don't have all the time to go into those right now. But hopefully you can see the power of a simple strategy like this to create monthly income in an easy, consistent way with minimal effort each week. So I'll sum it up for you. For my analysis of the weekly chart, Bollinger Bands, and Max Move data, I choose the best index, index ETF, to sell the double-double iron condor on each week. I sell in four-week cycles using the weekly and the regular monthly option cycles. I set up my trades as good to cancel orders, typically on Sunday evenings. I set uh, a 4% return on risk for the trade and typically sell my positions to give me a little buffer of credit. And I use that buffer to buy back the trade for 10 to 20 cents, usually in about two weeks. Once in the trade, there's not much that I need to do, but let time work on it for me to exit. What are your risks? Well, one of the sides of the condor could get attacked, as Doc just talked about, right? causing you to lose on that side. It's not impossible, but I set these trades up with a 95% chance of winning. It's all about stacking those odds in your favor from the get-go. 
And then I have those defensive rules that I'll employ well before being attacked to ensure that I can either exit for a profit, win the trade, or at, at worst, try to get up for right around break even. Hopefully you can see the power of this type of strategy. You know, can you see that can give you leverage in the market, allow you to create kind of that monthly income steadily instead of just buying a stock or an option and hoping it goes the way that you want it to? And can you see and understand how the system can give you that control over your income and provide great returns? Remember, the system can be the edge. And so lastly, and most importantly, can you see the power of using a strategy like Double Double, the strategies that Doc shared to create an investing system that can work for you consistently with just a small amount of effort each week, no matter what the market is doing. And I think you can from all that we've shared, right? You can have a professional trader-like business without spending professional trader-like time. And I think that's, that's the key to it all. And that's what we want. And so here we are, summary. Next steps and Q&A for you guys. So to summarize everything we went through today, your mind is your biggest asset or your biggest obstacle to your success in trading. Understand fear and risk is a tool that can help you succeed. Remove yourself from the herd. Use the seven steps to help you work toward mastery. Find your one thing. Your strategy is your greatest edge. And by stacking odds in your favor and having discipline rules, you can create a massive advantage recognize the signals of changing markets and adapt your strategies to those markets and then find a wolf pack to run with. So speaking of wolf pack, what if we told you that you could be part of a wolf pack that's already proven itself and help thousands around the world succeed in their trading? Well, that is what 12 minute trading is all about. You literally get to look over the shoulders of doc and I on a daily basis and participate in what we're doing for everything that we do. Our service include eight different option selling strategies from weekly options all the way up to monthly and six to eight month cycles, right? For income, 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 that's what we're after. And a lot of it is set it and forget it as much as possible. The goal is consistent, passive income with little to no effort, really base hit after base hit. And if you're new to the style of trading, you ever seen these type of things before, we have all the training you need as well as the daily live sessions with Doc, weekly training with me in addition to live YouTube sessions that Doc and I do each week, other private events that we, we have for students to help you learn, become more success, successful. And we've worked really, really hard to make the 12 minute trading services really the most comprehensive and best value in the marketplace. We deliver everything. And I'll just put these on the screen real quick. My service, five different short long-term strategies, weekly advisory newsletter, video analysis, market updates, trade alerts for any move I make before I make them, comprehensive student portal with training and everything you need, live training sessions. And I do it all for just $97 a month. Doc, service that includes proven income, daily trading room, best in class education from one of the top mentors in the market, tracking tools, trading alerts, trade diversification, comprehensive student portal, your daily income potential, live every single day in the markets at 11 a.m. Eastern for you to go see, all for just $147 a month. But because you're here tonight, you don't have to pay these prices. As a special gift for attending this event and spending time with us today, we're gonna give you a one month all access trial to both services. After that, if you want to continue, you get a 20% discount off both services as a bundle for just $197 a month. You can cancel at any time. So you literally have nothing to lose. Just a couple contracts of one of our daily and weekly trades pays for this. This is absolutely the best offer that we've ever given together at 12 Minute Trading. And it's not going to be something that we just keep up forever. We're going to make this available through Sunday. So take advantage, join 12 Minute Trading and our Wolfpack and really become a better, more successful trader with us. As an added bonus to this, Doc and I were talking earlier, we thought this would be fun. The first five people that take advantage of this will get a free 30 minute strategy session with either Doc or I, your choice, to review your current trading plan and help ensure that you maximize your success one-on-one. -on -one. So all you guys have to do is go to 12minutetrading.com forward slash Wolfpack. Again, that's 12 Minute trading.com forward slash Wolfpack if you want to take advantage of that. All right, I'm going to come back on the screen. Doc, you can should be able to come on the screen now. I think we fixed that for you. And we'll open up for any Q&A that you guys have. You want to ask us uh, anything, um, just go ahead and ask away. So I, I see one, I see an attendee that says, uh, how liquid uh, would it be to buy back an iron condor? And I think that was answered. Doc already, uh, already answered that. Yeah, we trade, you know, the... The, the instruments we trade are all the standard ETFs and everything. So there is no issue with liquidity or anything on those. 
So good question though. Any other questions? Go ahead and ask away or any other thoughts. See, Ken, remember Doc from Theo Trade? That's cool. Um, let's see here. Looking for a few others. That's been almost five years now. I know. It's been a long time. Long time. Well, yeah. we talked about we got together 15 years ago is when we did our first uh, product and stuff together and then worked at different times together over the years. And just for some reason, fate kept bringing us back together. So it's uh, it's a blast to have us together here now. Uh, let's see here. Open questions. Bid ask on the rut is really wide. That removes some edge. Depends on the trade, right? There's times to trade the rut and there's times not to. So I'm pretty selective. I do like trading the rut. Um, you know, at times I think there's a good advantage to it, but it, it's uh, it's more opportunistic, right? The SPX, pretty consistent. Um, the NDX can be a little bit like the rut. You know, the NDX, though, I like for the larger trades, right? Um, and so that is something that is... Uh, for me, um, I use the the NDX for those bigger, longer trades. Um, I see, Doc, you're, you got the answer. We do have an annual plan or a longer plan. If you guys want a annual plan version of this, like the bundle, you get a little bit more of a discount. It's $19.97 a year. We can get you the link for that if you want it. In fact, we can send that out when we send out the replay with this and stuff too for you guys. So if, um, if that's something that you guys want, uh, we can give that. So all the same things apply. It's just a little bit bigger of a discount if you want to go annual. All right. Keep going. I see a couple more questions. Looks like that was answered. That was answered. There we go. Oh, thanks, Cliff. Uh, in St. George, right before the IM this past year, it was so exciting to see uh, prepare for the race. Hot, though. Yeah, those. Uh, that's a tough course. I did that uh, last year. Um, and, man, it... I did the full Ironman there last year and it was a brutal race. It was 95 degrees, desert heat, you know, the mountain climbing out there. I think we climbed 9,000 feet on our bikes. So it was, uh, it was a pretty wild, uh, wild race, but uh, a third of the field, it was the Ironman world championship. They had moved it from Kona there. A third of the field dropped out of that race. So I was just happy to finish it. It wasn't my best time ever, but it wasn't my worst time. So I'll take it. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? I know we've gone over, so appreciate it. Um, both of you have different strategy. Why should I subscribe to all services? Will it violate focus principle? No, they actually are really complementary, right? So, you know, Doc and I, a lot of the, we have a lot of similarities in the strategies that we trade and how we trade them. It's just when they're applied and when they're not, right? So like a double-double trade complements Doc's weekly or daily high probability trades really, really well. You can be doing the high probabilities and layer in your double doubles, right? So there's a really nice complement to it. I think that's why people that have both services really like that. You know, I, I give kind of these more high probability trades, uh, more really far outside the money kind of, I, I always say a lot of times, kind of set it and forget it. Boring. Watching paint dry. You just, <laughs> you let them do their thing and get you to profitability. And Doc is obviously more active, shorter term, that sort of thing, right? And so you get the best of both worlds. Um, you can, if you want to try one or the other, you can do that too. Obviously we're giving you a trial of both for a month. And at the end of a month, if you're like, hey, I just like Docs or I just like Dave's, can I do that? We can change it up so you just do that too. So, you know, you kind of have all the options in our world. We don't lock anybody in for anything. You know, you can go month to month. You know, what's, you what have, some you know, people, to go in. what so, some people do is yeah. more of a pyramid type approach. They, uh, they use the slower, longer trades that you do with a, a bigger portion of their, of their portfolio, and they use yep. the smaller, uh, sharper, quicker trades with a smaller portion of their portfolio with my stuff. Yep. Or you could and do it the opposite. You could do it the opposite way, but it's probably better to do the slower stuff with a larger, chunkier portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a great place. I always tell people like, if you're sitting in cash, like just sitting in cash and it's not doing anything for you, you know, like I've got a long-term, uh, longer term strategy. That's really, really far out of the money that, you know, goes out to uh, four to six months where you just, um, I'm collecting, you know, six to 8% on that money. You know, that's where I park a lot of the cash I have just doing that to collect a nice return. So it's not sitting in a bank account. Um, and it's, it's beating what you can do like in treasuries and stuff. Um, and I like to do that with it. So, you know, teach their own, but 
they can complement really well and you can set it up just like as doc said so good questions any others guys All right, if there are no others, we can let you guys go. Uh, hopefully this was informative. Like I said, we were going, we're covering a lot of ground tonight. So we're gonna get this recording out. It should be actually up on YouTube now if you wanna go back and watch it on YouTube, but we'll send it out with uh, the links and everything for you. Um, and we'll add that annual link to the, uh, the uh, page when we send out the replay so that you guys have it. But uh, thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your time. Thanks for your interest. And uh, if we can ever help you in any way, just let us know. Otherwise have a, uh, just a great, great rest of your evening and best in your trading success. Thanks everybody. Hope to see you online.